Hi, I'm Peter, and this is Go Verb and Out. Hello and welcome to part two of my interview with Joe Hansen from It's Okay to Be Smart. Uh, in this part, we're going to wrap up the discussion about his channel, uh, and then we are going to jump right into a discussion about science communication, its importance, and how it's been evolving as of late. So, if this is something that interests you, and I bet it is, because you're probably just watched first part, and if you haven't, click the link. Uh, let's put over... You'll see it. Uh, click that link, watch the first part, and then come on back, and we'll be waiting for you. Okay? And now that you've done that, go ahead and let's get into it. Could you walk me through the process of making a video from start to finish? So, I, how do I come up with ideas for videos? Uh, I, I come from a science writing background, like literally until I, I even after I started my show, I wasn't really like sure I was going to be like a video guy for a long time. I'm, I, I still call myself a writer who happens to talk to the camera. Um, so I have a science writing background and I've written for, you know, Scientific American's website and Wired and stuff like this in the past. Um, and I pay a lot of, I, oh God, I read so much science. I just love science journalism. Like, what's going on online in terms of being able to connect people to science People talk about the loss of science on television. Well, the internet is more than made up for it in written and video form. But I am, I, I, I have so many idols of science writing out there whose, whose work I follow. And uh, thanks to things like Twitter and, and being able to follow all these some great, just amazing websites that have, that have assembled these geniuses of, of science writing, um, I read just all day. Just, just seeing what they're, just, it's part of my constant learning process. To, to, to constantly be grabbing information just so I can be enriched. And along that path, I, I'll catch them and be like, whoa. Like anything that makes me sit back and say, whoa, that's cool. Uh, put that in the idea file. I've got just got like hundreds of, of, of notes in, uh, I use Evernote and anybody who uses Evernote knows exactly what I'm talking about. If you become addicted to it, 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 it saved my, my idea life. I uh, would just file these things away. And like, to, me, to me, creativity is about connection of uh, these sort of uh, uh, previously disconnected influences. And that's what we do, is we, is we piece things together to create something new. To me, the scientific process and creative process are very similar because when I did research, I would take influences and previous data and, and what was known, and we would get to the edge of this circle of ignorance, and we would see uh, how do we wade out into the darkness with our flashlight and illuminate it a little farther. And when you're creating something, um, I hate to tell uh, the creative people out there, but there are very few new ideas. Music will teach you this, art will teach you this. We are, uh, we are a remix species, um, whether or not we are aware of what we're, we're mixing together. So um, whether it's making video or art or music or whatever it is, we are constantly assembling connections to make new things. Science is like that, that's what we're doing here. We're, I take information and, 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 and data and, and characters and interesting times and I mash them all together and try to create a story out of it. Well, that's, that's so similar to what we're doing in laboratories and in space warehouses or wherever they build rockets and places like that around the world. I mean, these are just such, it, it fascinates me, the, the parallels of this. Um, so back to how I make videos. That's, I'm, I'm constantly assembling these pieces. And you never know when they're gonna fall together in, and draw a picture, when those dots are gonna connect. Um, but I tag them and I pay attention to what they're about and all of a sudden one day it's just like, all right, I, I've been thinking a lot about clouds lately. That's weird. I found this video about clouds a while back and now I just stumbled upon this book at the library that like really explained to me for, for the first time like how clouds stay up. And I'll piece this together with two or three different things and call my friend who happens to be a cloud physicist and have her tell me about what's up with clouds, pun intended. Um, and before you know it, you have, like you have the, the skeletons of a story. And then, and then when you have that skeleton, it's about applying the flesh, which for me is, is more than the facts. Like I, I don't wanna be a trivia deliverer. I don't wanna tell you, I don't wanna regurgitate information um, I want to we have to make this meaningful to people like none of us are two-dimensional science beings that are just interested in this stuff like we want to know about like who found this what's weird about them what was weird about the time that they were working in like is there something strange that happened in clouds uh, you know 
how did they come up with these silly names for them? Like, well, there's stories behind all of this stuff that enrich that. And that's what turns a lesson into a story. And that's what I try to make. Um, so for me, it, this, the skeleton comes from, it, it, it drops out of thin air in a sense, when, from just always being open and curious and paying attention uh, to, and, and asking, constantly asking questions. And then I, I, pl I put that flesh on there. Uh, it, that's where I do the research for me. Like when I, when I dig, I'm like, all right, how am I gonna fill this out? How are we gonna make this look cool? Like what pictures are gonna make this look cool? Like what animations are gonna make this funny? Like, is there something from pop culture that we can get in there? Like there's so many different ways of layering that, 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 that body that we deliver out there. Um, that's the fun part for me. If it's, you know, it's never enough to just do the science gotta do science plus that's been my motto forever like even since i was just writing online science plus blank fill in the blank that's the fun and then all right so now that's how we get the idea um once we have the idea how do we make a video uh, i work with a team of uh depending on how how big we want to i think it's like six people from like my the my, my producers to uh, my director, a guy named Joe Nicolosi, like super talented. The guy's made re the Reddit front page like four times with, with his short films, just amazing stuff. Um, uh, Andrew Matthews does my editing and, and graphics. And like between the three of us, you know, we, we sort of, uh, we take that skeleton and, and that's, we together start filling in all those pieces. And I provide the information and then Andrew's just like this creative genius when it comes to art and drawing and animating. Um, I'm so lucky to, it, Austin's a great town to work and find people like this. Uh, we have, luck have a really strong film community to, to, to call upon. And, and again, with like these lucky resources, we get to, we get to make these like really rich stories that, um, uh, so it, we sit down together and, and, and start adding these pieces in, like what's gonna make this look cool? What's, what's funny? We all got different senses of humor. Like they don't come from a science background. So they, they, they like, like help me break out of my, my nerd cocoon into like the, the, the bigger world and, and, and draw on some influences. Um, yeah, and then, and then we shoot. And, and, and then, and then I, I, it's great to have creative people working with you. Like Hank talked about this again. It's like when you meet people that do something that's in your head better than you thought of it, uh, those, are the, the, those are the lucky people that I have around me. To, you know, to just trust them, and then together you make something that's even better than you imagined, and then we upload, and, and then we press refresh. <laughs> How do you imagine your audience? So I don't make videos for scientists. Um, people, I make videos for curious people who may or may not know that they're interested in science. Part of my job is to make them interested in science. Um, you know, I, I picture my audience a lot like I picture an, a, an, a younger version of myself or like a non-scientist version of myself. Like to me, uh, I'm answering my own questions first and trying to share that experience with people. So that's what I picture. Um, but you know, I'm not necessarily trying to make more scientists with my videos either. I'm trying to make scientifically literate science minded people um, you know we actually do a pretty good job of making scientists in, in in at least in the US we certainly need to change the ratios of who those people are in a big way in many different fields but we do pretty well when it comes to making scientists where we where we need more help is making scientifically literate people um, and whatever that even means, like scientific literacy, but at least people that are interested in science and curious throughout their whole life, like beyond when they graduate. Don't view graduation as an escape from learning. They view it as, as, as a jumping off point. That's what we want them to do. So I view, yeah, I view my audience as, um, as that person. And, but they might not all be there yet. So part of what I do in my video is, is try to turn the viewer into that person to show them, you know, we, we, we make videos about such basic things sometimes, like uh, on its case, we're like, we, we talk about things like wind and clouds and you know, where, what's up with an avocado? Like, that's just a weird thing. 
But when you get to, these are common things we see every day. Like what is more common than seeing the sky and seeing clouds? Like if I can explain to somebody how that works in a way that's meaningful and entertaining to them, um, that's to me is gonna change their life far more than if they have like a detailed knowledge of the current synthetic biology technologies or something like that, which is also really important too. But uh, simple doesn't mean basic or, or, or unnecessary or, or boring. Like this, Richard Feynman called it like the, the, he called it the pleasure of finding things out. Like think about why a rubber band works. Watching Richard Feynman explain how a rubber band works is the most interesting thing, one of the most interesting things I've ever seen. Um, so I'm trying to create that experience for people because what's around you is what's going to be meaningful to you in science. It's not the intricacies uh, for everybody. It's not going to be the intricacies of like uh, different layers in the fossil record or um, you know how we are, how pesticides are impacting uh, you know a certain frog population. Like these are all important science stories, but uh, and, and and deserve coverage. But sometimes the simple things can, can be the most meaningful to people because that's that's their life. That's what they're going to see. Um, I don't picture an age. I don't picture a gender uh, because you know, every time we try to do that, like the results have, have have been completely off from what we thought we were doing. It just turns out that like that people of all ages and backgrounds have a desire to find things out in a way that's meaningful to them. You, you don't, uh, there's a motto that some science writers use that you don't underestimate their curiosity, you don't overestimate their vocabulary. Simple and meaningful. We just try to picture, we try to create those, those people and then I try to picture that version of myself before I knew what I'm, what I'm talking about that day. So let's talk about science communication and what's up with it. All right, so science communication. Uh, we all love the movie Back to the Future. Well, the future is like next year, officially, according to the movie, I believe it is October 2015. So we don't have that much time left. If you were to look at it another way, the future is basically now, like we're, we're living in it. Um, it is just literally and figuratively inconceivable to live now and not, uh, if at least pay attention to science, hopefully be aware or even more hopefully literate in this stuff. Uh, this is this is gonna this is the new alphabet. I mean, this is this is would be like not understanding how plumbing worked or something when we get to this point. I mean, our society is so technologically um, not only advanced but dependent. I mean, we're. If we don't keep people up to up to, to cur you know to, to some st the current standards on science, but we're just moving so quickly, we have to help people stay ready for the future, which is currently all around us. Uh, that's why science communication is important. Um, now, traditionally, science communication has been done in this top-down, the very like limited. A uh, very privileged manner where I'm going to publish my paper in this journal that you got to pay $70 a pop to get a paper out of, and it's going to be written in a language that appears to be English, but on further analysis is really only using the same characters and much larger words and many hyphens and some Greek symbols. So we need to break out of that too. And we're, we're living in the time that is just destroying the previous modes of communication here. I mean, uh, there's something we talk about called gatekeepers a lot. Uh, YouTube is famous for breaking down the gatekeepers that were our cable companies and TV stations and, 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 and production companies. Like you just get to put it out there. Nobody's in your way. You got a phone, you got, you got a webcam. Well, gatekeepers are gone. Same thing has happened with science communication in general. Um, we, you know, we, we, we cry about the loss of science sections in our newspapers um, as like this, this stat, but that's something we pulled from like the 80s. Like Carl Sagan said that. Nobody picks up the newspaper anymore. Like it's, that's an irrelevant complaint to me now. Like we don't need that. That doesn't exist. We have the internet. We have blogs. We have uh, things that used to be printed on paper and still are to some degree. Like, you know, they, they're putting, they're putting amazing science out there online. The best part is the scientists now get to talk directly to people. They don't have to do this through these like strange sort of English translations of their work. 
Um, and that scares like journals, this scares the, the, the traditional models a lot, but uh, it, sorry, this is the new way forward. This is, this is how it's gonna be. Um, so you know, we're doing that now, like, you know, I'm a scientist, to, I don't do research anymore, but I'm talking directly to people. And there are people all over the internet, whether they have a blog that's read by 50 passionate geneticists that work in potatoes, <laughs> but they're like, that's the best potato genetics information out there on the internet. Uh, I mean, astronomy does this amazingly well. Like this year we had this finding about whether there might be uh, proof of gravitational waves in the universe based on some satellite data. Um, you know, this would have taken years to work out if we had to wait for letters and, and, and journals and scientific debate to, fold, to, to, to unfold that it has since the 1800s. But now we have Twitter. We have, we have YouTube, we have Google Hangouts with astronomers who are debating this in real time. Uh, we're just, it's, it's faster, better, um, and, and, and sometimes more entertaining uh, than, than we've ever done this in the past. So people, we've answered these questions. Like we have, we have honest scientific debate going on in ways we never thought possible, thanks to breaking down, busting open the gates. Gatekeepers are gone. We've just rolled right over them. Uh, the big question is sort of, what do we do next? With great power comes great responsibility when it comes to science communication because we, when you let, when everybody can have a voice, anybody can have a voice. Um, and we see that this has not worked to our benefit all the time. So it's important to have people that can step in and correct misconceptions, quickly step in and say, no, maybe you don't want to read that website. That's maybe not the one you want to go after. Uh, maybe you don't have to be scared of that big scary disease. It's not going to eat you for dinner. Here's what we know. Like, here's what you know, and you can trust us. That trust is incredibly important. Scientists are really well trusted next to like firefighters and priests and soldiers. It's like scientists when you poll people about this stuff. Um, yes, yeah, so we have the ability to step in and, and, and do this directly to people now, which is amazing. Um, but we have to make sure that we continue to do that and that scientists know that they have that opportunity to, to, to speak directly to the people who, you know, their research matters to these people. Even if you work on like... You know, today I had to call at noon and now I'm free until... Uh, you know, say so yeah, scientists have this ability now to talk to the people who's, who are impacted by their research and who fund their research. And this is incredibly important too. Uh, people like to attack things they don't understand because oh, they got fruit flies in them or, you know, it's studying some obscure tribe in the Amazon to see how they deal with uh, the color green or something like this. I mean, these are important to understanding what it means to be human, what it means to live on Earth, what our impact on this planet is, what our future on this planet is comes through science. This is, this is the lens through how we see and discover new things about the world. So we want trusted people out there who know what they're talking about to be able to not only deliver the information to people, but we have the power to respond to them and answer their questions now. Um, so, you know, science communication uh, today, you know, it, it's, it's going pretty well. Like, I'm optimistic. Um, some places need to catch up. Like, cable news and, and, and even schools. Uh, but you know we're on the cutting edge of this right now and nobody knows what all the answers are, but we know that I'm pretty sure things are moving in the right direction. Okay, so that's part two. Now for part three, it's gonna be a little bit different as usual. So for the third part, I decided that uh, I just wanted to let Joe talk for a while. He had something that he wanted to talk about and I thought that was legit. So that's what it's going to be. And of course the side effect of that is that I'm going to be talking in it a little bit as well. So if that's what you like, well, brace yourself. Uh, because it's about to start real soon. Once you click that link. Go ahead. Do it. Any second now. Alright, there you go. Okay, I'll see you soon.